Thank you so much. Um, so both of you guys talked extensively about history, and I know people always say the cliche, if you don't learn your history, you're doomed to repeat it, which kind of um, segues into what do these um, movements, um, like what impact do they have on us today? And so a question that I had specifically was how do these past movements that both of you mentioned, um, civil rights, the India liberation, and, and such movements, inform the work that both of you do every single day? Um, what are the importance of recognizing intersections in our social justice movements? And how do we use that intersectionality to um, connect and, and take collective action? And also, this is a, a pretty loaded question, but since you touched on this, I also wanted to say, um, how can the youth, the people sitting here today, all of us, how can we um, take the initiative to um, take the initiative to create movements of our own? So um, I don't know if either of you are takers on this question, but I'm just gonna pass it to Sister Aisha. Here you go. Yes. Well. <laughs> Well, I mean, y you must take it on, you know, I mean, this is your life. Um, I think the first step is to become knowledgeable, uh, to, to educate yourself about the issues of your day. And I think that um, there are a lot of organizations out here already that are doing work to empower the Muslim community. So I think that um, if you're not starting a new movement, or uh, if an already existing uh, movement is afoot and it speaks to your passion, that you may want to look into uh, joining already existing organizations, locating your passion, because it's important to know what you're passionate about. And why is it important? Because the work is going to become difficult. And when the work is difficult, and in this climate it is increasingly more difficult, it's important to be passionate about what it is that you sign up for because ultimately it will be your passion that will see you through the difficult times. Uh, I would also like to stress that as Muslims, it is critical that we know, have a working understanding, knowledge about what our religion offers in this context, right? That to realize that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, that our traditions uh, speak uh, overwhelmingly about justice in the world, and justice not just as it impacts the Muslim community, but humanity. So I think that it would be important for you to make sure that you put yourselves in positions where you can learn about your religion. And as you locate your passions, many of you may have already done that, that you be informed so that when you go out to advocate or work on behalf of those issues, you're fully grounded in your uh, religious uh, traditions. Uh, also, I would encourage you uh, not to just look inside the Muslim community, but to also see yourself as players in the context of your society and find those places, those organizations, those leaders who inspire you to work for what is right and just for all people and not just the Muslim community. But first and foremost, you need to become aware and educated about the issues and then ground yourself in the work, inshallah. And you should also know that there, is, there are people who are available and around uh, who are willing and able to mentor you. So to reach out to your elders because your elders have a wealth of knowledge and experience and wisdom for you to draw on and more than willing and, and excited uh, to share and support and encourage you on, inshallah. I can't really add much to that uh, very eloquent answer. The only thing that really comes to mind when I heard this question was, 
really thinking about the prophetic tradition and our faith. Um, we have so many examples in our faith and from the Prophet's life وسلم, that give us ways to deal with the modern issues of the day. One example um, I touched upon uh, at a previous panel was around poverty. It's a huge issue in the United States of America and all around the world. And at its core, poverty is rooted in income inequality. And I believe that Islam and our faith and what we're taught is the best to be able to tackle this issue head on. For example, in the Quran, if you read Surah Al Taqibun, it mentions how personal wealth in our faith is considered a trial, and it is also considered a gift that is entrusted to the wealthy by God. And this is also mentioned in several uh, surahs, Hadith, Baqarah, and Surah Al Nisa. And to see how the wealthy are able to handle the wealth that is provided to them. And the poor are also entitled a share of society's wealth. And this is also mentioned in several surahs throughout the Quran. So I think when we're thinking about poverty and when we're thinking about social issues, it's really important to kind of dig deep and learn more about our own faith tradition and what that says about certain situations like poverty. Reading these surahs, you would think, wow, Islam is truly a socialist faith, one that wants those who are disenfranchised and who are left out of society to be empowered and to have equity and access to resources. So I think it's really important. So my advice to young people is before you try and search from outside of yourself what you can do, search within your own faith tradition and search within the history and the legacy of our great prophet who was the first activist, I think, in our, in our Muslim faith because he stood against treating the poor negatively. He stood up for feeding your neighbors. He stood up for racial equity. He stood up for gender equity. And these are all social issues that we face today. So I think it's really important for young people to not only grasp to the ritualistic aspect of our faith, which is really important as well, but to also grasp to the core of who our great prophet was the best of mankind and to really grapple with that in a true and authentic way and to implement that into our daily lives. If you're praying five times a day but you don't think to support the masakeen and you don't think to support those who are less fortunate, what kind of Islam are you practicing? So I think it's really important to first and foremost really build that um, basis of which you operate from. Um, and I think that I would also again bring into light the ways in which we can learn from mentors. I think that for me, from the time I was a young girl, I had mentors, whether it be my aunts or my mother or community elders who I was really inspired by. And I would sit with them. I would seek knowledge from them. I would get their experience of whether it was a spiritual or political or academic or the ways in which they resisted against state oppression. So I think it's really important to find the voices in your community who have always been vocal. Everyone knows the auntie and uncle who just grabs up the mic and it's like, free, free Palestine or some protests. We all have them in our community. And I think that really being able to sit with them and to learn from them and to sort of implement that in your daily lives. Um, and just to add to what Sister Aisha was saying about learning about organizations, I think that's really key. There are so many amazing Muslim-led social justice and racial justice organizations that you can be reading about, that you can see what sort of events they're hosting in your local community. Um, you can even start your own. I mean, I know people who are 16, 17, 18 starting social movements. You don't need to be an adult to have a voice, to have a platform, to have access to social media. You would be surprised. There's young people that I meet around the country and I'm like, whoa, how old are you? You're like 15? I would have never thought of, 
about doing that at 15 years old. I probably wouldn't even know how to use the technology, quite frankly, that you young folks are actually using today. And technology definitely comes with some burdens, but at the same time, it comes with such great opportunity to affect social change. So I think that you know what's most important is really coming into your own voice, utilizing the platforms and resources that you have, connecting with the folks in your community face to face who you know are at the helm of social movements in your own neighborhood, and really just acquiring all of that knowledge and, and putting it into action. Thank you. Thank you so much, that was very insightful. Um, so I have another question that is very similar, but um, so like one point that I really liked that you made Sister Aisha about um, educating yourself. And so the question I think applies to that because after um, we educate ourselves about these movements and the resources that we have available and things like that, how can the youth of today um, learn from those that education and apply it to issues within our own communities, things like um, police brutality or Islamophobia, things that um, everybody has heard about or experiences personally, um, but kind of feel like the youth may feel helpless in such a case. And so uh, what do both of you think on, on a, that topic in which, like, how can we apply our education into community local problems? Yeah. Sure, go ahead. <laughs> Civic engagement. I mean, it's just two words. Um, I think it is really important, and it's a huge word, and it is an umbrella of all of the amazing things that you can do in your neighborhood, that you can do in your state, you can do in your city, you can do nationally, you can do in your massages, you can do um, at school, any place where there is community, you can build. So I think that we should never limit ourselves to the ways that we can engage. Many people just say, okay, we're gonna do grassroots organizing. That means you have to do a protest, you have to do a rally, um, you have to do a town hall or something like that. Um, and, and not to say that these things aren't useful. I do these things on the daily. This is a part of uh, my life's work. I do protests, I do town halls, I do rallies. But those aren't the only ways to get engaged civically. You can host film screenings about a really important topic that's impacting you directly or those in your neighborhood and you can have a dialogue and discussion after. You can have weekly halaqas with your friends where you don't only just talk about faith, but you talk about faith in action and practice and what it means for your life. You can start a youth program at your masjid if you don't already have one. You can utilize social media and create your own campaign, something that you are truly passionate about, something that you know that's impacting you directly. I think that oftentimes we wait for an opportunity to open itself up and we wait for the perfect organization to kind of sign our name on to and attend a few events. But I think that it has to be more than that. It truly has to be something that you feel has to be addressed. If you don't really care about police accountability or police brutality, what was the other thing? Police brutality and what was it? Islamophobia. If you don't think that these issues impact you or your loved ones or other people and you don't really care about that, no matter what organization you join, you're not going to be affecting any sort of positive social change. I think we have to dig deep as human beings and find our empathy. I think a lot of people that are, are just walking zombies, subhanAllah, like you'll look at them and you it's like as if there's no human connection left. And I think that that comes from a lack of empathy, that comes from a lack of caring. So I think once you get to that point where enough is enough and you're seeing people suffering and you know it's a part of our Islamic faith to support one another, you will find that way. Whether it's an initiative that you start on your own, you don't have to wait around for an organization to do it if there, if there isn't one in your community. You can start the work without an organization. 
And if you do choose to join an organization, there's so many online platforms. If you're interested in anti-racism work, I encourage you to look up Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative. If you're interested about learning of the intersections of being black and Muslim, read Sapello Square. If you're interested in digital organizing, follow Empower Change. If you're interested in civil rights work, there's 33 national care chapters. There are so many ways that you can get involved in our community and it doesn't also need to be just in our community. As Muslims, we are in, as human beings, we are entrusted as protectors of this world. Not just as Muslims, in Surah Al-Baqarah it says as humankind, we are entrusted as protectors of this world. That means we don't have to only build with other Muslims. We can build with the Latinx community who may not be Muslim. We can build with the other Asian communities, other African American communities who may not be Muslim. We can engage with communities that might need our support without having the precursor of them sharing our faith. So I think that those are all very important ways to look at it. Um, definitely don't limit yourself. I know Islamophobia is one of those issues that we see as the Muslim issue. Um, but it's, it's not the only issue that we face. Almost 50% of our community is at the poverty or below the poverty line. So on one hand, we're fighting Islamophobia, which is a real threat. But at the same time, we are fighting homelessness in our own communities, within our own families. So don't be single issue thinkers. Don't be single issue activists. Really look at the issues that truly impact us, like homelessness and poverty and mass incarceration. Yes, we have Muslims in jail, right? I, I really caution us from just looking at Islamophobia as the end all be all issue for us. We live in this country, we are Americans, and we have issues that all Americans have in this country, whether it be around immigration, deportation, detention, poverty, homelessness, lack of access to health care, and jobs. So I think don't limit yourself and just figure out ways to get engaged, inshallah. I'm gonna be quick uh, because I don't want those young men who are leaving to leave. I wanna know what's on your mind. Um, I wanna know what's on your mind. What are those flags there? What do they represent? You can tell us what those are. We had them divided into teams when we were doing activities. Okay. Wow. You have to know the context, you know, the, the culture, the climate that we're living in also. Um, when you choose to do work, and there's all kinds of work that you can do. This is the United States, pretty much the, it's wide open for you, you can choose. Um, the most important thing is to know what your passion is and to just kind of work with that and be informed by it and trust it, you know, uh, because that'll you know, hold you steady you know, for the long term. I think that uh, the arts are a very important uh, part of our tradition and it's something that we have neglected for a very long time. And I'm calling for you to now go back and find your artistic leanings, your bearings, and bring it forward, you know, to speak to the issues of our time. Uh, during the 60s, there was something called the Black Arts Movement. And what that was is that socially conscious artists created all kinds of art, all genres, but it was all directed at inspiring people who were involved in movement struggles. So I think, again, we are so rich in our Islamic heritage, 
but somewhere along the line we drop the ball. So I'm encouraging you to go back and pick up that ball, you know, tap into your creativity and let it be your activism, whatever that is, inshallah. And you know what the guidelines are, and they are broad. And we need to see you display your awesomeness through the arts. Because by doing that, you also inspire others to step up and join and be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem, inshallah. So I think that you will have to ultimately be the one to decide how you want to engage. You have an open playing field. There are all kinds of opportunities out there for you. One thing that I would caution you against is just living on social media. It's important that you have human connection, right? You know, you need to form some kind of local get-togethers, you know, where you can see each other, you know, you can touch each other, you can look into each other's eyes. There's no substitute for physical connectedness, and that must happen at the local level, right? So social media is fine, yeah, we'll use that. It's, you know, tools of our time, but you should not be resigned to think that that's all there is. It is just one tool in our vast toolkit, and you must take advantage of all of the tools in your kit. And I think one of the things that we are missing is our human connectedness because we have disappeared into the stratosphere, right? So you have to bring that back. You have to have human connections with each other and build from there, inshallah.